Welcome back to the Levity Zone. Yours truly, Dr. Bruce, is back on a long trip, literally halfway around the world. I started out at the Science of Consciousness Conference in Tucson, Arizona, bounced back for the 30th Contact Conference to Sunnyvale, California, and then zoomed off to Islamabad, Pakistan, where I am now. Along the way, I presented our new approach to life's origins and had a live video chat with Deepak Chopra in front of 20,000 of his fans. Met with the leading planetary scientists studying where to go on Mars to look for signs of life and generally had a splendid time. I'm now finishing up here, helping my longtime company re-engineer the way they build our products the great-grandchildren of those Elixir applications for PCs that I wrote back in the 80s while in my baby-faced 20s. During one beautiful April spring day here, I journeyed out to a wonderful lakeside retreat handcrafted by Shanaz Manila, the wonderfully energetic former partner and current friend of Elixir founder Basit Hamid. We spent a delightful time gup shopping. Pakistani for shooting the breeze, while breezes flowed and Pashtuns from the north of the country, where Shanaz is from, installed English-style thatch roofs. Did I mention how amazingly creative Shinny is? We started out discussing my term lock-in, which I use to describe the prime driver transforming humanity into tech-connected, time-sliced, consumer- and capital-based robotic lives. We then moved on to how to counteract lock-in by providing support for Pakistani artisans so that this relentless machine of progress doesn't crush them out of existence. Pakistan has one of the world's finest craft industries, largely undiscovered and unexported. As China develops this region, and the U.S. thankfully departs, many of these highly skilled hand workers will find their livelihoods replaced as mass-produced goods enter the market. This is a classic example of what has happened all over the world, to the point that entire skills treasured for a thousand years are now lost. So join me now in the beautiful, bird-filled, fragrant-aired springtime in the heart of the old Indus civilization for this conversation of the future fate of part of what it is to be human, our connection with craft. Oh, partway through, one of the cute puppies here started an exuberant rearranging of the gravel beneath our feet. Listen for it. You can hear the batons doing the uh, doing the thatch in the background. So we're here with Shinny and Bunigala and Peach Street, which is uh, your retreat center you bought in '98. In '98, I've just realized, huh? Yeah. So I was asking you, Bruce, um, because of technology going all crazy, yeah, mm. and um, how are we going to sustain this technology? Well, the thing is, the technology sustains itself. So, but humans are getting locked into it. So, this is what I call lock in. It's where you move to the new flats being built here in Islamabad. You get the smartphone, the big TV, you know, you get the job, you have debt, debts to pay, you have to pay for family. Uh, and you have consumer products you have to buy. Yes. And and you're constantly locked into social media and stuff like that, and you have to raise money for ch children education and commute, and you don't wake up and never see the dawn. You never are part of the, the holy hour, the sacred hour, and you're just, uh, you become a robot. You become a, a packet, a, uh, a mechanism in the machinery. So you're one unit of delivery now. And so as the, everyone's commuting you know, on, on the highways and the motorways and there are units of delivery for the machine. Fantastic. And it, the finances died into it, politics is controlled by it. Hmm. That's lock-in and it's happened to two billion people in 25 years. It's My breathtaking. 
two billion, billion people in 20 have gotten locked in. Two billion fully, physically, mentally, it, mentally emotionally. socially, uh, emotionally, they have less and less access to emotions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because it's all mental stimulation. Mm -hmm. So they, they lack empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and the children are getting trained into the system early. So lock-in is a huge uh, mechanism. It's very self-sustaining. Um, and it's going to take most of humanity with it. I don't think there's much that can stop this thing. Have you come up with this term yourself, Bruce? Yeah, it was years ago when I was in Peru under a building just like this with a thatch. I, I see, and you realize, yeah? We're in, we're going to lock in. We're locking in. And what, what will happen to those people who don't make the lock-in choice? They do, what do they do? What do they um, do? They're okay? Yes and no. Um, Why no? Because if you're not, if you don't have the smartphone, you get locked out of the economy. Like you can't order a ride service. You can't, you can't buy a parata, you know, can't go to the chemists. Right? So how are you, when cash disappears, like physical cash coins, so those people are locked out. So when they're locked out, can't they still maintain the simple lifestyle that they used to without being... Perhaps. I don't know. Uh, they might be able to. So the Patans that are here... Yeah, they're... They're, they're there, right? They're not in, they're not in lock-in. Not at all. So they're some of the only, only people left that aren't locked in. Are you serious? No, but why? Are you only talking about Pakistan or your, the world or what? In the world. Why? So there are simple people around the world. There are simple. There are fewer and fewer. So, so for example, in Afghanistan, in uh, the Patan country, which you call, what do you call it in Pushto? The Patan lands. Pukhtunistan? No, no, no. Pukhtunistan. Uh, uh, that is one way. Why? So, Pukhtunistan, it has the old way. Yes. There's only a few places that are still left that are that way. It's maybe one of the biggest ones. In the world? In the world. That's left. No, but haven't you, there aren't there the various other tribes all over some places no. in Africa? And Very few. So, so for example... And you're talking about functioning societies. Functioning societies. So most of them are not functional. I get it, the w other ones. The other ones. So I go to the Amazon. Yes. And in the Amazon you have maybe... 1% of the people still living in the rainforest. Hmm. You can see them alongside the river. They have big thatched buildings, two stories high, poles. They're pole houses yes. like you're doing here. And underneath, the pigs are living. Hmm. The pigs and the chickens and the people are up above. Hmm. You find that in Thailand okay. you know, and things like that. Uh, but 99% of the people have moved to big towns. And they live in sh tin shacks, and they have big TVs and smartphones and They've free also jobs. Done that. Yeah, they're locked in. So a place I go called Pucolpa in Peru in the Amazon is exactly like that. But if you go up into the Andes, uh, into the Sacred Valley, a place called Pisek, you can get to 5,000 meters. You find people called the Quechua. Okay. And the Quechua, they're they're like these guys, hmm. and they. They have beautiful bright faces. They have clear eyes. Mm. They don't use much cash, right? Because all their needs are met. They eat guinea pigs and they eat potatoes. Got it. Because they live at an altitude where there's no trees. Super high mm. Andes and uh, fresh water. Uh, they make colorful clothes. Mm. Fantastic people. And they come down, like their children's come down to go to schools mm. to join the tourist trade. Mm. So they send their children to walk four hours down mm. to residential schools to learn how to be a modern person. And these are kids that eat with their hands, that don't use utensils. They have, uh, they have dirt on their faces, which helps them to develop an immune system. Mm. So the, the Just like our children over here, the poor children, yeah. Well, the parents put the dirt there. They put it, for, purposely put it. Yeah, for health. Wow. Yeah, and these kids have red faces because they, they're from 18,000 feet, you know. They're from really high, out, high oh up. My, in Peru now, huh? Yeah, in Peru. So those places, the high mountain places, tend to preserve the old ways. Because no roads to some of those yes. places, right? Yes, and there's no access. No access and no electricity and whatever. So, Bruce, when you talk about Pathans, have you done research or why are you saying this? 
I've done a little bit, but I, 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 no, I, I know just from meeting them here. But Got it. Yeah, a name, you know. Yes. Names whole, um, his whole persona. Is, yes. Yeah. I just love it. I mean, I love to come in contact with it. Yes, mm. and these, you know, these guys are just like that. For instance, Iqbal over here. These guys are he's not here right now. They're just so. Mm. They're just so earth, yeah. So these people are disappearing, right? Uh, so they are in Peru. There's there there are little bits. There's none in Europe. Uh, there's none in uh, North America. It's mostly gone. Mexico is mostly gone. Oh uh, little bits of Mesoamerica, it's still there. But, you know, you go to a place like Brazil and they've devastated the rainforest and there's me mega cities, 30 million people. What, are the, what about that, that race that believes in, what are they called? Oh my god, I forget the name. The ones who don't believe, who are totally locked out also. Yeah, there's um, there in the United States there's the Amish. Amish, that's exactly. Yeah, and they they have to actively resist it, right? So they have their Do horses. They, uh, are carriage. they existing? Yeah, they still exist in Pennsylvania. Yeah, so they have a horse and carriage. Yes, they they drive cars and probably have cell phones at this point, but they have a really strong uh, culture to have to resist everything. But they are dependent upon the outside, so they make crafts. They they need finances coming in from the system to keep going. So now, Bruce, our country is in that state right now, okay? Mm. And just before China comes and takes over, you know, we had crafts, and I don't want those to disappear. Mm. So what do we do? We need to yeah. preserve those, huh? Well, uh, I have a friend who lives in Ghana, mm. and if you go to markets in Ghana now, you yes. know those beautiful, long, decorative, colorful print outfits? Yes. They're all made in China now. So the most local West African thing you can imagine... Is made somewhere else. ...is made in China, to make it look like a craft thing. This is in Ghana, where you're buying them, and they're made in China. Oh so God. it's a machine, right? So it, the machine will grind up and take over anything that is monetizable or copyable. And that's exactly what yeah, they're and going to do with everything in Pakistan also, crafts, I guess. Well, it'll take a chunk of it. It'll take a piece. So do you think a, a handmade craft is going to have value still in the future world? It will as a specialty item, like for example, rich people, they seek them through, say, Etsy. The Etsy website features these handmade kinds of crafts, and, and they, they sell them for more, so there's, that's still going on. And there's a whole movement in craft, uh, like uh, responsibly grown foods that are grown on farms, and so there is an economy around There that. is an economy There is that. an economy. Because, yeah, it's exclusive now, I guess, you know. But for most people, those crafts will go away. Like in the United States, 99% of what people buy is made in a factory, you know, not handmade. Never. You know, Anything, you know. In the olden days, we used to have, you know, clothes for the weddings done by hand. It was a very specialized thing. Now the whole machine has taken over hmm. all the work. The weddings? The wedding clothes for women. Yeah. We're all hand done in the past. Oh. Now that's all machine done. Really? So you get the same complete look, the same expensive look, but uh, the machine is doing it, you know? Wow. And uh, just the, the cotton fabric, you know, this hand, hand loom. So what do we do now, Bruce? I want this to remain in Pakistan and I want to export. Export. Whatever. What? They, what? Because, you know, the local market has no appreciation for something that is made no, locally. No. So I really want to now gather and maybe it's the collaboration we can start doing. Well, you know what? Years ago, I would go up to Lok Virsa. Yes. And buy these most unique things. Yes. I mean, these unique wall hangings that yes. were circular. Yes. There's no way you could find that in the U.S. Like, there were things like these made out of paper mache from way up in the different Honza, areas, yes. Europe in Honza or something. Yes. Little camels and things like that. They're made out of paper mache. Yeah. They're very beautiful. Little bells. Yes. You know, and made by just one family. I mean, I think that the only way to sustain that is to 
collect those artists yes. together as a yes. collective yes and then market them as one unit in things like etsy or like online but get into an online marketplace and first collect them collect them yeah get a, a collection of the best people who can deliver pretty consistently in higher volumes get like for consistency and higher volume and then uh, create some kind of collective you know payment system uh, i have a friend who has done this with the wechol in central america and they make beaded pots like beaded gourd things like super fine and they have this collective fishies managed to centralize it all and then money goes back to the wechol village and part of it is for the people and part of it is for infrastructure mm. to build out their water systems and things you know I see. So that it, it, part of the money is to invest in them as a people, mm. because in some sense, if it all just goes to the people, they're not such a cash people, you know. So if they understand that what we're doing is we're we're doing this thing in order to build a better school or, a, you know, it's going to pay for something for the whole community, you know. So then that yeah, apparently there's a guy in Sri Lanka who's come up with this model. It's like the Grameen Bank. It's like the mm. huh for crafts. For for I don't know it's whether it's for crafts. No. Uh. So that's what we need to do, huh? A sustainable thing for. Yeah, and I'm sure there's hundreds of these things online. I see. You could study hundreds and hundreds. I see. When I go to Lima, I go to the Indian market, and I go to one particular stall because it's a collective of Indian crafts from one place, and the quality. and the innovation is so good because what you'll find in in these big markets is the people are stamping out the same stuff they're they're copying other artists because they think that's what's selling but actually what people are looking for is unique things. yes and so this particular collective every time i go there i'm never i'm never disappointed there's always something beautiful and it's a women's collective where is this in peru peru and uh i always compliment them and they're always very pleased about it these really sh- short women they're probably witoto or shipibo round faces and there's always two or three of them selling but then there's a whole village that has um made several villages i think so okay so you've given me a brilliant idea bruce that to collect them over a couple of whatever years or whatever because there's a huh yeah and then but i will require initial investment or i ask somebody for that or what no just make a site for instance we have beautiful blue pottery in multan yes and it is clear gorgeous it's yeah okay this blue color huh yeah like that that vase over there the big vase yeah so oh, it's, don't it's it's famous right yeah, yeah. and, and multan t- is one of the oldest cities in the world and the tile work is and the tile work they use it on all the so, mosques yes yeah So what do I do now? I make a whole website. You think? Well, what you do is you'd go to the craftsmen, yes, craftspeople, yes, and take not only the pictures of their work but of them, Got of them it. and their lives and how they make it. Like document, like we just did with the thatch. Yes, like how these guys are making English cottage thatch in in Pakistan. But yeah. there's interesting story along with it. their houses their people and you you tell their story and yes. then then you make that your storefront in whatever site and then people come to see the products but they can click and they can get the people's stories and, and get a personal connection so now listen bruce i want to do this for all parts of pakistan because we don't know how to market ourselves as mm-hmm. a nation mm-hmm. and now just the time is right now i and think it is yeah it's just the right time because i you know then we can create a movement of that they shouldn't be bought over yeah and do it before they go out of business because unfortunately it, it, they're going to yeah. go out of business yes they are and so with the new airport opening next week yes. we think what that means for this area is a lot more shipment yes right so there will be more air carriers coming through because you have to be able to ship this stuff hmm. and all these goods out yeah so there'll be more capacity for air shipment yes and that's the way that you're going to move these goods to the market because you're not going to need a like a central hub 
where say these Multani yes. vases come in, yes. they got to be packaged very carefully. Right? Yes. Uh, and beautiful uh, designs for uh, these crows are. <laughs> The crows are in, uh, having their day. They're all talking to one another right now. So what you're saying to say the shipment is is going to be good for doing this. Or so, so consider you, you hire other craftspeople to make beautiful wooden crates, like yes. wooden boxes, yes. that are ha also designed. Yes. And then they have the 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 special. Um, wrappers and straw or whatever needs to be in there or might have to be you know uh, protection for the vase mm. and then something that's put in which is a printed material um, showing the family and the person who made it got it right yes a little simple brochure and then you um, that's air shipped right and then a uh, the person gets that somewhere in the world opens it and it's a whole experience right because they can smell the straw coming out they can see the picture of the person that made it can you imagine how beautiful that is so there's a huge amount of value in that and then they keep the wooden box is also useful maybe instead of just for a vase box so they build a wooden box that has a drawer in it yes so that you can use it Beautiful. Crazy things like that. So the box is also a, it's a gift to them, you know. And so they don't even know they're getting this extra box. And so they get it and they get this beautiful Multani vase and then they have this box too. And they like, they feel the generosity. And so they show it to their people that come over for dinner. <laughs> it's like, exactly. And they said they want to buy it too because it's all word of mouth, you know. So suddenly somebody in Copenhagen is like you get five or six orders in Copenhagen and hmm. so then you have a, a craft center that just makes containers beautiful hmm. just makes packaging absolutely